Hi, welcome back to our video lecture. This is part two of our chapter five um, lecture looking at um, uh, consumer and buyer behavior. In the previous video lecture, we looked at consumer behavior, meaning end users like you or I. Um, in this lecture, we're gonna look specifically at business buying behavior, meaning uh, purchases made on the part of firms and businesses and things of that sort. And because it differs somewhat from end consumer behavior and how it's, you would market to these types of buyers, um, we're going to trade this in a small, like not as large, uh, long as the previous one, but we're going to go into some specific topics here. So let's start with the roadmap. So we're going to look at how do business buyers differ from consumer buyers. Secondly, we're going to do how the business markets um, are different from consumer markets, which means business markets um, tend to have, uh, you, you, they're, they're, they're more steady in the sense there's a lot more repeat buys of the same items over and over again. And it's more tied to you know to business conditions, meaning their own business conditions, but also um, long-standing relationships with particular, let's say, uh, providers. And lastly, we're going to look at uh, what e-procurement uh, is. So business buying behavior refers to the business buying behavior of organizations, and this is the key word here. When you're talking about business buying behavior, you're not talking about individual people buying something. You're talking about organizations as a result that there isn't just one buyer. Usually there's a committee decision or a group of people who are buying things or making procurements for different goods. Um, and this has come up particularly in recent news when we talked about getting PPE for different hospitals and for different states. Um, so when you're making large purchases like that, um, usually you have stable relationships. You're not, let's say, going to a store, seeing if it's on the shelf, seeing what the price is, and then making a decision. Usually you're buying the same product over and over again and you have established relationships. And so what you're sometimes seeing is the shortfall of some of those repeat, repeat buys or volumes that really don't, um, that are not available. The other thing that you're seeing is, um, and this particularly came with um, uh, the difference between uh, consumer markets and business buying markets is, is for food. So that some of our food production goes toward, um, you know, grocery stores and things you'd buy in a store uh, for end users, but some of it goes to things like restaurants. And so what we're seeing in our current environment is that restaurants, all the food that was targeted to restaurants, repeat buys of things uh, for uh, restaurant food stuffs, is not being able to be sold because it's not sold through the same channels. Um, and as a result, they don't have uh, um, barcodes and other ways to track it. And so what you're seeing is that even though there's a need for a lot of food by people, they're actually destroyed, um, and things that are in short supply like milk and dairy products, you also see that producers like da uh, uh, dairy farms um, are destroying their own things, which means they're just pouring out the milk because they can't sell the milk because they were selling into kind of a business market as opposed to a consumer market. And this just shows you that there's kind of different channels in the economy that not everyone is buying the same product on the same market. And as a result, you know, because some of this is just for institutional use or for business use or repeat use. So when you don't have things like, you know, cheesemakers working or you don't have, let's say, uh, milkshakes and restaurants and that, all the different types of dairy products that would have gone to that can't be just easily redirected to, let's say, a gallon of milk on, um, on the grocery market shelves. So business markets tend to be a lot larger than consumer markets because they're buying all the raw materials. Um, they tend to make large purchases. They're making purchases for longer periods of time. And so they tend to be larger and they also involve like, you know, higher dollar numbers uh, than you would in the consumer markets. Um, the market structure is also different. And, and this is, uh, so for example, in the business market, there's not going to be, let's say, an infinite number of buyers, so that there's not an anonymous market. There's relatively few buyers, um, so that, for example, if you are selling uh, PPE or medical equipment, there's only so many people who are going to be buying medical equipment, doctors, hospitals, etc. but it's not an infinite amount, and so you're not really trying to, let's say, create a buzz or get something viral. You're trying to convince people that you're a liable producer of, what you, uh, of whatever, thing, whatever item that you're selling. Um, the second thing is that business demand is derived from consumer demand. So the point is consumers are putting pressure on the businesses and the businesses are putting pressure on their suppliers. Um, and so as a result, you know, there's kind of a two side to this, which is that um, they want to make things available to their um, the end consumers, um, but they're not going to, they don't want to store a lot of things. They don't want to manage the inventory. They'd rather, let's say, uh, push that back onto their suppliers. Um, and what you also have is sometimes is business cycles. And so businesses don't run 24-7 um, in terms of their demand. So like, for example, with auto manufacturers, they make most of their cars in one time of the year, and then they kind of, let's say, pause for, for a time. They retool their factories to the next model, next year's model, 
Um, and as a result, um, there's a lot of demand for raw materials at certain times and then almost no demand at other times during the year. And so you have this seasonal fluctuation, which can be a major part of this. Uh, same thing with things like uh, 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 frozen um, vegetables and fruits and things of that sort. You're going to have a harvest very concentrated one time of the year and the rest of the time of the year, you are not really, let's say, in the market for uh, some of the inputs. So another a good example of a uh, business market is Intel. Like no one really buys microchips directly, although microchips are involved in a lot of different things in phones and computers and tablets, whatever. Um, so the point is, though, they're still advertising to the end consumer. So this is Intel and they kind of the idea that uh, they make their chips in a very clean environment because even small like dust can scratch uh, microchips. And so that you're contrasting, let's say, the idea of your idea of clean with the idea of Intel's. What they're just saying is their products are manufactured to higher precision under more stringent conditions than, let's say, perhaps their competitors. And the idea is that what Intel often does is that they advertise that they are part of other people's products. So in early computers, you used to have a, a sticker. In fact, on my computer, it says Intel inside, suggesting that this computer has an Intel microchip and therefore it's a higher quality um, um, product than one that would, might have an AMD chip or some from some other chip manufacturer. So what happens is you're still going to advertise to your end users because you want them to put pressure onto what on, onto let's say computer manufacturers, PC manufacturers, tablet manufacturers, uh, cell phone manufacturers to demand let's say the highest quality inputs into their products. Um, the second thing about business markets is that the, the nature of the buying unit. So the point is that you're not there. You know you have a lot of different people who are going to make purchases because you might have different like divisions of a company who want the same item, but they want it for different things. And so they might have different criteria, they might be pushing uh, different standards, um, they might need different volumes in other parts of the company. And so there's gonna be more of a, they might have someone who's in charge of purchasing, but that purchasing agent, that purchasing department of the larger business is gonna to have to talk to all the different uh, users of the business and find out what they need and what they want and what their standards are and have to harmonize that across. And so the point is, is that you don't really are just selling to one person. Uh, you're selling to a lot of different people with different needs and different standards. Um, and so what often happens is that, you know, you'll have, uh, you know, the instead of waiting, instead of just advertising and waiting for your customers to come to you, you're probably going to go and make a direct pitch to your customers saying, I'll go to this corporation and say, look, I have this new product. Um, I'll give you one example. So I had a former student who is making uh, bakery items to sell in different stores. Um, he doesn't try to influence the end consumer as much as that he will go to different places and say, look, would you like to carry my product and make a, make an offer or a gimmick to them? Say, look, uh, you can, if people don't buy my product, uh, you don't own, you don't have to pay me the cost of it. And therefore the risk is all on me. And so you'll see this where there'd be much more direct pitches than you might have in the consumer market. Some of the key um, differences is that um, as I kind of alluded to before, business fighters are making complex business buying decisions because they might have different parts of their company that have different uh, standards or different priorities. And as a result, this is going to be a more complex buying decision. They also have to kind of, in a sense, predict what the end demand is going to be before it because there's kind of a lag between when they buy the inputs to their, their product and when they provide their product. Um, another uh, part of this is that they have to, there could be changing uh, market demand, which means uh, People might want one color uh, one season in terms of clothing and another color a different season, and therefore they have to make sure that they have the right fabrics, raw materials at the time. Um, so very often with like uh, fashion, uh, decisions are made about a year ago for this existing season's line. Um, the process is more formalized, mostly because there's repeat buys, and as a result, that you know that you might very often what will happen instead of just the uh, the seller just saying, this is my product, how much do you want? They might um, solicit like an, a proposal from their, um, a solicit proposal from their, from their customer saying, um, I want this, this, and this with this criteria. And then they'll come back and say, well, I can do that, but here's the price it's gonna be for these different features. And there'll be a little bit more back and forth. Um, another good example of this is that um, I once toured a factory that uh, made food processing equipment uh, for people that were doing things like, um, uh, you know, uh, pickling meats and things of that sort. So things like cold cuts and whatever. And so this company made the machinery for companies that were manu uh, processing foods in different ways. Um, and so what often happened is they had a huge warehouse and they would 
in a sense, assemble the production line inside the warehouse. And for different products, they, in different capacities, uh, they would uh, custom make each, let's say, machine for each individual customer. And different types of foods require different types of finishing and surfaces, um, levels of sanitation. Uh, and, and so the point is that there was kind of an ongoing process describing what the product would be. Um, they more or less say, look, we're going to sell you a solution. We can make a lot of different things, but, you know, um, and this thing could be negotiable along, along the way. Um, and because there's kind of fewer sell, fewer buyers in the market and relatively fewer sellers for business markets, um, they're a lot more dependent on each other. So if you are an auto parts manufacturer, um, you're only making auto parts for a particular uh, um, a company like GM or Ford or things of that sort. Um, and so you want to make sure that your products go into GM and, they're, and, and it's gonna affect their supply chain and have a good relationship with them. And very often, you know, GM wants to make sure that all the parts are available when, when they're going into a process so they don't have to, in a sense, start from zero every single time that they change to a new model a year, that they have a lot of their parts lined up. So there's, that's different than, let's say, when end consumer market where consumers are relatively anonymous, they come in, they come out, um, you don't necessarily, you do have a long-term idea of customer value, a uh, lifetime value, but you're not going to necessarily fight for one individual customer because that customer is only doing a small fraction of your overall business. So some of the buying situations that can emerge in a business market situation is that you can have, let's say, a straight rebuy, which means every month I buy 50 units of this, and then the next month I buy 50 units, and the next month I buy 50 units. Um, and this is what you're seeing right now with hospitals and PPE is that they know how many masks and how many gowns, whatever they go through in normal conditions, even let's say in high, in high very busy conditions um, in normal times. Um, and therefore they know to, let's say, look, I'm gonna need this many masks. And there's kind of like a, a, a uniform purchase every single time. And they have a certain amount of uh, supply back kind of to handle the slack of the ups and downs in the market. Um, and what you're finding very often is that, you know, now that they need so much more than they did ever before, um, their suppliers can't produce that like on the drop of a hat. Um, and so what you're seeing is a lot of scramble for anyone who has a back supply or anyone who has, a, a, you know, PPE or N95 mask in a warehouse somewhere uh, because they can't just go and say, let's say, double my order uh, because they have this routine reorder and because most people are making straight rebuys. Um, you could have a modified rebuy, which means you're buying the same product, but you might be turning some particular specifications. You might need a... Um, uh, a different color, like so if you're buying, let's say, fabrics, you might be buying the same amount of fabric, but a different color, different pattern, um, maybe different terms of suppliers, depending on what their marketing conditions are and things of that sort. And lastly, you can have a new task, and this is what I was describing to you before with the food processing equipment, is that every single product or service is for the first time. Another good example of that is there's a company in Dutchess County called NERAC, and they make conveyor belts. Um, and so like things, you know, little like lines that move things from one place to another. And every single conveyor belt they make, um, even though they have patents over certain types of designs and certain types of processes, um, is unique to the, ap the application that's going in because you might be putting conveyor belt in a different space and therefore uh, the, the size, the length. And so there's not standard pieces. Everything is made to order. Um, and so what you're often doing sometimes is selling a system. So for example, if you're doing a computer manufacturer, uh, if you're selling them the hardware, you're also probably producing the software, and that is a service that's being provided. You might, uh, if you're doing things like uh, Xerox copiers, um, you don't just sell, for example, the actual machine and say, here's the machine, have a good day. You're also probably buying the person to service it because copiers break down and you can't just wait and buy a new copier every single time a copier jams. And so part of it is selling the overall solution, which means we'll provide you a copy system, we we'll provide you the paper, we're also going to provide you um, a service repair person who will be able to fix it um, uh, relatively quickly. So, um, a buying center is, um, you know, somewhere where um, that all the different individuals and units participate in the buying decision. Um, and so, this is what I'm uh, is. You might have a purchasing agent for for a larger company. Uh, you might have everyone going through an individual person. You might have different people making purchases for different parts of a company, and they all kind of put in their requisitions to one person, and that person then takes it from there. Um, uh, so 
you sometimes see this in terms of a school where someone in the front office manages all the purchase and requisitions and handles all the forms. Um, there's someone in the, uh, the main administrative office and you can have teachers, you can have janitors, you can have uh, a variety of different types of people making requests for different types of items, uh, but all going through the purchasing agent. Um, so what you can see that one of this, and I've been using this example because it's kind of relevant to current events, is that when you're buying a hospital, you have food, you have personal protection equipment, you have pharmaceuticals, you have um, gowns and um, uh, disposable things like, you know, think everything from a saline solution bag to uh, uh, gurneys and beds and all the different things. Um, and usually you have a lot more than what you need at any particular moment. But there's also things that are breaking down and you also can't, particularly in a hospital or a school, you can't afford to have like be short. And so there's a lot of things where someone has, is fully tasked in making sure that everything that is necessary is available. And this can even go down to like forms and paperwork, uh, computers, scri uh, scribe desks, things of that sort, batteries for the scribe desk because generally they're wireless in hospitals. Um, all those things um, uh, we might go through let's say, a, buying, uh, a buying center. So the stages of the business buying process are relatively similar to the consumer, but there's maybe a lot more in, like, so you have problem recognition, which we talked about before. Uh, you're going to do some search, and then the search is probably which is more detailed than it would be, let's say, in a consumer buyer decision. So you, for example, you might write up exactly what the need is, you need, might need to specify because um, since every single uh, business might have a different use, there's not a standard product, what often might happen is that you meet, you know, you do exactly what your need is, and you be able to describe it so that someone can produce a product that exactly serves what you need it for. Um, and then you're going to go look for suppliers. You might say, you might say, put a what's called a, propo a solicitation uh, proposal, with saying, uh, we'd like to buy such and such thing. What is your best offer? Um, because a supplier is not just taking something off, let's say, the shelf and saying, here is the product. Um, they're going to say, look, uh, here, we're trying to, uh, what you're asking, saying, we have this problem, we need this type of solution, um, there's not a standard existing product, what can you do and what would you charge us for this? Um, and you're going to take a, you're going to get a variety of different proposals. And you see this very often with, let's say, um, uh, landscaping and building trades, whatever, is that you might have a variety of different people come in, put a bid on, on the project. Um, and then you will choose whatever bid best suits your needs uh, because every house, every landscaping project, every type of repair is slightly different. Um, and once you have what you need, you might create like an order routine, which means things like straight rebuys or modified rebuys. You're going to buy the same thing over and over again because you're going to continue doing this term of business and you're going to review that process as you would and any like post uh, purchase uh, behavior that we talked about in the previous video lecture. Um, so here's another one where, you know, the problem of uh, identity theft that happens when you're doing things digitally or you're having connection or working on the cloud. And I think what this is saying is that, you know, not only is it uh, a problem, but they're also kind of showing that we are a solution to this problem. And I think that the key word, and I haven't been as clear on this, is that in the business market, what you're really are is buying a solution to problems rather than buying products themselves. Um, and that means that there's going to be a more systematic kind of approach to the purchase and a much more ongoing relationship than you would, let's say, if you're in a wholesaler or retailer with uh, end consumers. So one more thing is online purchasing e-procurement. Um, and there's various different ways. And this obviously e-procurement means making a digital like purchase online. Uh, so what a reverse auction is, is instead of like, you know, an auction where you have one seller and uh, uh, many many potential buyers. A reverse auction means you have one buyer and many sellers. And so, for example, you might say, I want to buy this, and then all the different sellers in the service area will make a proposal, and you'll take the best one. Basically, they're auctioning for your business. Uh, there are trading exchanges, which are just what they sound like. Um, you can have company buying sites, so, you know, a website where you go through and buy different products, and this could be everything from um, you know, construction machines to, um, you know, reams of paper to things of that sort. Um, and, and you can have links to other key suppliers, which means you'll see the, uh, the supply chain um, more visible uh, on, on internet or digital platform. So just to kind of uh, finish up here, uh, Cisco is something very important right now. They're basically what runs and uh, 
all the streaming that's occurring, they're the ones who are kind of doing all the support for that uh, kind of on the back end. Um, and so, so you're seeing like a lot of people who like WebEx would be one example of this, which is a little bit like Zoom. And you see this sometimes on network news where you'll see it like, you know, uh, available through Cisco and you'll see a little Cisco logo in the upper left or upper right hand corner. Um, and so they're not really selling their service, but their service is necessary as a platform for a lot of other things. And so what Cisco has, you know, supports a lot of different types of companies, ones that are more media based ones that are just more like a business site. And you can see here where they can, um, various different products from uh, security to video conferencing to uh, network storage, cloud space, things of that sort. So that's all for today. Um, our next uh, video lecture will be moving on to a different topic and we'll start on to chapter six. That's all for now. See you next time.